Hello and welcome to Electoral Dysfunction with me, Beth Rigby. Me, Ruth Davidson. And me, Harriet Harwin. Now, this is so exciting because we are finally, it's like the three musketeers. We're together in the studio for the first time because tonight it's our first live show on our mini tour. By the time you're listening to this, we'll have seen loads of you live in the flesh at our sold out London show. Look, if you've got FOMO, remember, you can still get tickets for our shows in Salford and Liverpool. We've got few left. Check the show notes for details on how to get yours. And if you're coming to see us, well, we can't wait to see you very soon. And can I just say... Ruth is wearing a tartan suit and I'm absolutely... Because <laughs> I'm not Scottish enough. I literally... She's not... If you didn't know that she was Scottish... Do you know, I, I I love the suit. I've had it for years. I've had it for about eight or nine years and I had to stop wearing it for three years because Theresa May had a black watch tartan suit that she, one, always wore when she came to Scotland, which I thought was a bit try hard, but two, also used to quite like wearing just generally and she wore it to launch her leadership campaign. I remember. And it, and it meant that, so I didn't look like a mini me. I had to not wear the suit anymore. Or you would wear it and it would spark headlines about Ruth Davidson signalling that she is running. She will run. <laughs> and she's preparing for leadership. So it got it got retired. It did. And now that and Theresa now, May's retired, you've put it, no, brought it out again. Now that I'm back in the fat end of my wardrobe, I've had to dig it out again. I love it. Do you so like it? I, I think it looks great, but I never worried about having matching with Theresa May. There was one moment where we happened to be on both, we were on the same side of a debate, other side of the house, obviously. We both looked at each other and realised we had exactly the same ginormous neck wear that we were wearing and I outrageous Scarlet Had you got them from Prue Leith? <laughs> it, it was a bit like, a bit Prue Leith, I have to say. So we then, you know, bonded over the issue, but also over our, our necklace. And I felt that sort of slightly upgraded me because she's very stylish, actually. As are you. I, you are both very stylish women. I'm going to pull for, uh, Harriet's leg there a little bit. Do I not remember, somewhere in the dim and distant, you having a go at Theresa May over wearing a T-shirt at the dispatch box saying that's what a feminist looks like because you said she was no sister. But at that point she wasn't, but she has transitioned. <laughs> she she, has, she has transitioned and into being. And it's partly because she had such a pasting from the men in her own party that she, I think she kind of, I mean, I don't mean it to be patronising, but she woke up and joined the sisterhood. And when she did, she was incredibly effective and did all that stuff on human trafficking of women and domestic violence. So she did become... A good sister. And she actually got there to be loads of women on the Tory benches because previously it was all men. Yes. And she got she lots of women, women there. She, yeah. she set up women to win. And um, that meant, I mean, those were a modern sort of Tory woman, not like the old fashioned Tory women. They were like the daughters of the feminist revolution type mm. of thing that had came into the Tory party that had already been in the Labour I Party. I remember the women to win stuff because um, I used, when I, many years ago and I worked at the FT, there was a whole debate in 2010 into 2015 election about whether or not, how were the Conservatives going to get more women on the benches? Theresa May had set up women to win to do this. And it was Anne of, Jenkin, I think. And Anne Jenkin. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and actually a couple of male MPs as well were, were part of it. And... Um, it was all about whether or not you would have all women shortlist and they the Conservatives couldn't tolerate it. And and basically, instead of... Theresa May was one of those women that just had to work quietly behind the scenes to affect change rather than... Yeah, in so the Labour Party, you just kind of went and did it. We and just it said quotas, did it. swept the men but out anyway, of a certain... She, yeah. she, uh, she's, she's got a good heritage. Did you know that... I Let me get this right. Her godmother is a Pankhurst. Did not know that. Oh, I didn't yeah, know yeah that. because there's something to do with there's this weird thing because I weirdly interviewed her once for a book and we were talking about um, female leaders and feminism and all this other stuff uh, and she was talking about how she had just been up at like the Pankhurst's house and that in that really really subtle quiet understated way that she has she kind of said oh yeah, yeah blah 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 as if it was like a normal thing to have a Pankhurst as a as a as <laughs> like a godmother there you go. So we are going to talk this week. That is so much to talk about this week. It's been hard to pick. Mm. But we are going to talk about the row over scrapping winter fuel payments for some pensioners, how that plays into the government's whole strategy 
of change and it also feeds into some of the announcements or the report that they've issued today around the NHS, the Prime Minister saying it has to reform or die. It's all bundled into these whole, this big debate about spending austerity versus fixing the foundations, as the PM would put it. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to get into new plans for MPs and second jobs. You'll remember in the election, Keir Starmer talked a lot about trying to clean up politics. But before we get into the meat of all of that, we need to quickly talk about something huge, huge it was that happened this week. Know ye that we, of our especial grace, certain knowledge and mere motion, in pursuance of the Life Peerages Act 1958 and of all other powers in that behalf us enabling, do by these presents advance, create and prefer our right trusty and well-beloved councillor, Harriet Ruth Harmon, one of our council learned in the law, to the state, degree, style, dignity, title and honour of Baroness Harmon, of Peckham in our London borough of Southwark. I didn't know your middle name was Ruth. I mean, I know that's not what we were supposed to take from that. I don't usually use it, really, because it (laughs) gives me the initials HRH, which is like a cringe... Her Royal Highness, <laughs> Baroness. Well, I don't know what my parents Harmon were thinking. I know. I mean, oh my PC. God. This is why I we did. need a bit of modernisation in the House yeah, of Lords. I, I didn't really understand what that was, but I think what you were being was ennobled with all those beautiful adjectives. Yeah, there's, you know, there's swearing in. And, you know, obviously I'm delighted to be in the House of Lords and want to do a good job scrutinising legislation and being part of the Labour team in the House of Lords and working cross-party and all of that. And you've got to have a second chamber actually scrutinising what the first chamber's doing. So all of that is important. But I think there's some things about... And people hate it when you join an institution and the first thing is you burst in the door and say, well, this has got to change and that's got to change and that's rubbish. But I do think there is a little bit of modernisation that Mm. needs to go on. For example, why do we have to be called my lady? Why don't we just be like Harriet Harman or Ruth Davidson, HL, like you have Harriet Harman, MP or Ruth Davidson, MSP? Why do we have to be sort of grand with it? And also, my children are now able to call themselves the Honourable I've said to them, if they start calling themselves on, as they were busy trying to change their Twitter handles and things like that, I said, if they do that, I'm resigning immediately. Because, you know, it's not right, really. There's a lot of things which are sending signals that are not right that we should change. Because you were there at the time at which it was reformed under Blair. And part of the trade-off was that people kind of got to keep the flummery because the the ones that were in it at the time kind of liked the flummery. But there's going to be more change now because they're going to move out of the hereditary peerages, which we're going to be voting on shortly in a bill, and stop people going on beyond 80, which is also uh, going to be there. So I think at the same time... With a big majority, could have done a lot more in terms of reform. Well, we can bring forward some amendments together. We can be the modernisation committee of the um, House of Lords, Ruth. Well, you on for that? Like you, I hate to be one of those people that joins something and then says it's all terrible. But I, I genuinely believe, on a point of principle, that a secondary chamber should be an elected chamber. And I don't discount that in an odd way, despite the fact that it's compiled rather unusually, um, that there is so much expertise in that chamber. But I do think that you actually can't go around the world talking about democracy if you've got one of the big strands of your legislature is just not democratic. And I would, I would vote absolutely for it to be in a wholly elected chamber and I would vote myself out of there. I mean, one of the things that strikes me as quite odd is somebody was saying to me, why are there bishops in the House of Lords? Why are we the only democratic country outside of Iran? You know, is why have we got bishops by virtue of them being ordained to be in the House of Lords? I also think that there is something manifestly unjust about the idea that um, if you're going to have people of faith that hold particular offices in an institution like a parliament making the laws that it is only one denomination of that faith because it's only church of england pickers Mm. so it's not even the established church from other parts of the country um it's not catholic um priests and, and cardinals and stuff like that it's not rabbis it's not other faith leaders so i think on point of principle and on point of practice it is wrong just to be clear now i've got two baronesses on this pod what what what? You how genuflect. should I address you? 
you genuflect. You, you should bow on your way out the door. So if I said to you, I, I don't like Lady you. David, so you wouldn't like that. Uh, no, Lady Harmon. I, I would really struggle. Like and and, I, and it, I mean, if I, I'd absolutely love it. I'd insist everyone called me Lady <laughs> Beth. <laughs> Lady Beth. I'd, I don't know. Okay. I like. I, I really struggle with it. But the and reason why I think you're struggling with it is because of the legitimacy issue. Is because you feel yeah. troubled having been an elected politician. You feel mm. troubled. No, yeah. but going back to this House of Lords. So, the bishops. There's what twenty bishops. So you think that they should go? What about hereditary peers? There's about ninety-two of them. It might, might well be that bishops have got a role to play in the House of Lords, but how they get in there should be the same way as how everybody okay. else gets in there, not by virtue of having assisted places, reserved places, which are decided. So you two are going to be turkeys that vote for Christmas. I, I, and I would vote to go far beyond the reforms that Labour are putting on the table. And you would as well, it sounds like. Harry. Well, I'm already signed up to what's in the Labour manifesto of um, people not going on beyond 80. And I'm mm. really heading up to that far. So I'll have to have a new reinvention oh, after that. Um, How old are you? I'm 73, so I'll need a new reinvention when I'm 80 because my mum lived till 100, so I've got three decades left virtually to be, like, cracking on. I should say, actually, because Labour have put reform of the Lords into the manifesto, I think it began as an idea to have an elected second chamber. I think that's where, start from memory, that's kind of where it started. And it's ended up as a, yeah, it's, what, getting rid of hereditary peers. There's nearly 100 of them. And then this age limit of 80, right? That's as far yeah. as labour But I got. think they'll still they'll be thinking about what yes. else to do about it. It's just in terms of the manifesto yes. promises, the clear way forward. And, yeah, and that, there's going to be a bit of a, a struggle, though. I think there might be a bit of a fight because traditionally large constitutional change are usually done in a bipartisan way. Mm. And this isn't being done bipartisan. The Tories are going to dig their heels in and fight so, for their editors, and there's what, I think. And there's about, so I'm, I'm going to be a pariah in my own it's party. It's so I would, stupid, I the, the Tories deciding to fight for hereditary peerages. For, I mean, those, basically, this is people who are scrutinising government business, who are actually in a legislature by virtue of of being born as the eldest but a bit of tit for son tat or daughter. Here I mean, that's just, you can't justify that. There is a bit of tit for tat here, though, because uh, in the coalition years, there was a proposal that was put forward by Cameron and Clegg yeah. to have an 80% um, elected, 20% appointed chamber. And Labour came out against it, and then it didn't go mm. anywhere. Mm. The fact that Labour came out against it was pretty much the last nail in the I coffin. You two are in the upper chamber and you are scrutinising legislation and uh, you both voted this week on the winter fuel allowance, We did, you? yeah. And how was that? God, it was so nice not being the bad guy for once. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and also being happy to go and vote because quite often I've been really troubled because lots of, before the election, lots of the... Um, votes that were coming through were about the Rwanda scheme, which, as mm. you know, I've been a long-term critic of, and I would, I hated it, still hate it. Yeah, and just to quickly remind yeah. you all, it's um, a policy the government announced in July that universal payments to pensioners for their winter fuel, it's worth up to £300 a year, is going to be restricted to just those pensioners who receive pensioner credit. The Treasury hopes it will save £1.4 billion in this financial year i don't need to tell you how controversial this has been as a policy uh the unions hate it lots of labor mps really unhappy about it although in the end only one john trickett actually voted against it but 52 mps did abstain suddenly a lot of mps had dentist appointments or doctor's appointments or some pressing need to totally swerve the vote harriet you presumably did vote for it and and how did that feel for you well i voted with the government and what this has been about is that first line in labor's manifesto that we were going to put the finances on a solid footing and then when we got into government rachel reeves said well i've been into the treasury looked at the books and there's a 22 billion pounds black hole and then there's the government's faced with the idea that one point four billion pounds goes out of the door 
in this financial year, which is such a problem. And it also goes to people who really don't need it, which is the winter fuel allowance. So they decided that they would instead means test it. And the big argument has been where the cutoff point is. Yes. There's two places you could cut it off. You could cut it off by not giving it to pensioners who were on the top rate of tax. Um, but that wouldn't yield you enough savings. So there's, yeah. if they were looking for a, a, a big thing to actually stop money going mm. out of the door rather mm. than just incrementally, this is the big amount of money. And then they say, we'll protect the poorest pensioners who are on pensioners' credit, they can keep it. And then there's been a big argument, but what about those people who are entitled to pensioners' credit but actually don't get it because of the difficulty of claiming? And so that's where the argument was. I don't think anybody was saying it shouldn't be means tested. They were saying, but the means test is too low. But all of that's and lost, Harriet. I mean, I get that that's the, the government's position and all the rest of it, but it's the same as when we were trying to do stuff that's nuanced. At the end of the day, mm. you gave rail drivers a pay rise that takes them to 68 grand a year and you're taking 1.4 billion pounds off of cold pensioners and the analysis is that some pensioners will die like that that's it well i think the calculation from the government is because the um triple lock on the pensions means that this year pensioners have had a 900 pounds increase and next year they'll get a 460 pounds increase that that will offset the loss of the winter fuel payment and that the um, train drivers issue was that the pay review bodies which are independent had recommended this pay rise and we had to get the country back to work and the system operating again but one thing that's quite interesting to me is that this revolt sort of it, most Labour MPs thought well it's a manifesto commitment and we'll trust the government that it won't cause excess uh, deaths and yeah, only one as you say voted against and so with I, Tony Blair can I just do yeah, a comparison yeah. so when Tony Blair was doing the similar cuts um, and me um, at this point in the, the Tory government, the Labour government in 1997. Um, there was 47 Labour MPs voted against Tony Blair and 100 abstained. So what is interesting is that th th there's been a level of unity and discipline in the Labour Party. And that's another thing Keir Starmer promised. He said, we're not going to have splits and factionalising and rebel rebels we're going to have a coherent government and that's what he's done two things one coherence in the government government party two um, mending the fiscal problems that there's been so and i'm sure all of that matters inside parliament but outside to real people all they're hearing they're not hearing this is a greatly unified labor government what they're hearing is the first thing the labor government have done have taken granny's um heating mm. allowance offer uh, and it's also a lot of people, I think we've all seen from the analysis, voted for Labour because they wanted a change from the Tories. They did not want the Tories in government. And Labour have come in mm. and they've done something that even the Tories didn't do. The Tories put up the winter fuel allowance. You know, Labour are taking it mm. away from millions of people. And their argument mm. that, you know, that's OK to do that is because there's a triple lock of pensions, well, which the Tories introduced. I mean, it's 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 like Rachel Reeves being more Tory than Tory. And I get that there's a reason why politically she might want to do that. Mm. But I don't necessarily think that they saw the blowback, the reputational blowback, as big as it is. So a, cu a couple of things on that in, in terms of them, because I've been spending, I've spent a lot of time covering this and thinking about this and talking to people about it in terms of the manifesto what was interesting is that the protecting the winter fuel allowance was in every uh, labor manifesto from 2010 to 2024 and then it, it just wasn't in the manifesto so there are those on the opposition benches that say this was in Rachel Reeves locker all the time that they might withdraw this benefit now I've been told by Treasury sources that that simply isn't true, but you can see how that feeds into this cynicism of Keir Starmer said, on the one hand, we were not returning to austerity. And I think this is a run tension, Harriet, they're going to have in the autumn, that on the one hand, this government said that they would not return to austerity. But on the other hand, page one of the manifesto, that's what you know, I get briefed as well. The the priority is economic stability, and they've got this, they've got this running tension now. And cutting the winter fuel allowance when it wasn't in at all pitch rolled, just feeds into that narrative that they were planning to, the government were planning to raise taxes or log. 
So all the tax issues, which I hope will include measures of fairness, such as you've described, will be on October the 30th. But that would be too late for dealing with the winter fuel payments and making it means tested because you have to lay the regulation, which they did in August, for it to come into effect in September mm. so that it could not be starting to be paid out in October. So it's the mechanics that meant they had to do it outside of the budget because obviously it would have been much better to do it in the budget, October the 30th. Yes. But in order to stop the money going out the door and the black hole getting even worse, they had to do it in the timing they did. Just You've defended the, the, the policy very eloquently. It must be difficult for you. I mean, you introduced, didn't you introduce the winter fuel allowance? Yeah, and at that point, pensioner poverty was the worst sort of poverty you know if you look at the different groups of people in the in the country and um now actually families with young children including working families are the poorest and the ones who are struggling most with the cost of living and in terms of the kind of inequality hierarchy pensioners are not at the bottom so we introduced it like that and the reason why we did it flat rate Mm. is because there was a whole we couldn't do it by putting it on the basic state pension um, or by putting it on pension credit because we hadn't done pension Mm. credit there was no such thing at that point and also the basic state pension most women didn't get the basic Mm. state pension so we couldn't put it on the basic state pension we couldn't put it on pension credit the worst sort of poverty was pension of poverty so we said we'll give this one-off payment and we'll make it temporary and everybody said you'll never end it if it's temporary you'll be kind of stuck with it and it'll be a millstone round your neck and anyway here we are in 2024. Yeah but I I don't think that there's generational um, jealousy about the winter fuel payment to be honest I don't I I think there are a lot of people out there who are finding it incredibly tough including young families but I I, I don't think that there are any people in that position that are thinking oh well good on the government for taking that away from pensioners. The other thing that has happened this week, it's like putting out all your dirty washings. It's like just, you know, clear it, clear it all out to start off with. The other thing is this publication. Take of out a, the trash day. Yes, take out the trash day. That's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, the publication of this report into the NHS, Lord Darcy uh, commissioned, has told Starmer how bad the state of the NHS is. It plays into the idea that Starmer is talking about that the, the the NHS in a terrible state after 14 years of conservative rule. He's saying the NHS has to reform or die. But he also talks about a huge gap. I think it was 37 billion gap in capital investment and spend between the UK government and other uh economies in Europe for health service and that actually not only do you need reform, you need upfront investment to modernise the NHS. Again, how do we do that as a country if you in the short term don't either move money from other places or put up taxes? Well, I think that is a a brilliant analysis of, of the situation. And I mean, the paradox is you've got people in expensive hospital beds who don't want to be there and don't need to be there. And the links have got to be made so that actually the places where they need to be, the funding moves across. And what Wes Streeting has said is we want to make the the rest as good as the best, identifying Mm. where people have within the system already started cracking that and making sure that everybody does that because if you know if you've got 25 percent of people in hospital beds who really don't want to and shouldn't be there but can't leave because the systems outside aren't right that itself is a huge millstone around the acute sector's neck it's a good report and i think it's right for there to be benchmarking so that they they've like tried to benchmark on the economy this is the state of the economy 22 million back billion back hole this is the state of the nhs it's broken and i think they should do a similar one on local government because local government is also being massively underfunded because we need to establish the baseline from which we're actually building on and but it, but, sorry, how to interrupt, but that's like a funding cent- settlement for local government. Local government at the moment is saying we've got four billion shortfall. I mean, I'm just asking a more basic question about can you see a world in which uh, the new chancellor, when she's doing a spending review, is not going to have to have 
not going to have to find more money either from the capital budgets oh, or no, the she, revenue she, budgets. She will she's need to. She's going to have to, isn't she? She will need to, but she's got to do it in such a way that it doesn't, you know, Liz trust the economy. You know, having the public finances stable, she... Of course, she wants to do that. That is her objective. And one of the things that makes the NHS more effective and more productive um, is using technology and AI. And that requires upfront investment in order to make it more productive. So she will be looking to, you know, to opportunities. I mean, Rachel toured the country and so did Keir Starmer saying it's going to be grim. It's going to be pain. We're not going to be able to deliver on everything. And people said he's too gloomy in this election campaign, but he was saying how it was going to be and he didn't want to raise false hopes. And one of the things Gordon and Tony did, Gordon Brown and Tony, is that Gordon Brown said it was prudence for a purpose. So he did have a sort of couplet there is that people knew it was going to be grim, but they knew that there was hope on the horizon. And I think that that's the thing that Keir Starmer is going to be doing. Well, I think we are going to be talking about austerity, the autumn budget, the NHS, winter fuel on repeat. Well, I'm I'm interested to come back in February and Mm. see on the winter fuel stuff exactly where the public mood is and exactly what has happened over the winter in terms of of that because my I mean it might be a dog that doesn't bark but my su- suggestion is or my belief is that it, this one might might be a difficult one to shake off a difficult off. one but also as um as Harriet was talking in the round I think when the budget comes out as you said it might be that there are other things that are done that 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 somehow make it feel like there is a bit more fairness in the package of measures not least on on taxing as Starmer would say, those with the broader shoulders the most. Let's see what happens. But we are going to take a break. Now, I wanted to get into something we've not really talked about before, and that's MPs second jobs, because there is a crackdown coming. You might remember in the election that Starmer talked a lot about cleaning up politics, putting it back in the service of people. Uh, Now, a group called the Modernisation Committee of the House of Commons has announced they're banning MPs from advising on public affairs and they're going to have a proper look at MPs who have regular broadcasting gigs. Now, Sky News did some analysis on this last year and found that between 2019 and 2022, MPs made more than £17 million from second jobs. Now, we knew it was coming. Uh, Interestingly, though, the broadcasting element piqued my interest not least because there's one uh, new MP, uh, Nigel Farage, who has quite a lucrative broadcasting gig at GB News. Now, he, in the latest uh, Register of Financial Interest, which is where MPs put down their second jobs, uh, earned, I think it was knocking on a hundred grand uh, in the month of August, which GB News said was a monthly payment for 32 hours of work from Nigel Farage. He went on to say, that's not quite right. It's over a number of months. So I guess the question is, is whether or not it will actually really happen? And and, and do you think it will clean up people's perception of politics? What do you think, Harry? Do you think it will actually happen? Or do you think it's more performative? Is this performative politics from Sir Keir Starmer? God forbid. No, I think things are going to happen. What we had in the olden days under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown was we had something called the Modernisation Committee. And then when the Conservatives got in, it carried on for a bit and then they abolished it. And the new leader of the House, Lucy Powell, has re-established the Modernisation Committee and mandated it to look at three things. And one of the things that it's been mandated to look at is the question of outside work Mm. by MPs. So I think things will happen, but they'll happen by consensus and by agreement through a process. Now, the thing about MPs doing outside jobs is that when people run for election, especially when they run for election in marginal seats, they say to the voters, I will work for you. 
I promise you, I will be a dedicated MP. I will be up in the House of Commons um, challenging the government and holding them to account as your MP. I will be speaking in the House of Commons about what goes on in this constituency. I will be doing my casework and helping you with my problems. They do not say, I'm also going to earn sack loads of money doing something which is nothing to do with being your MP. They suddenly start doing that afterwards. And I think in terms of broadcasting, it's perfectly possible for MPs to do loads of broadcasting when they're MPs, which is really important for MPs to be on the media and on pods and everything like that, without actually being paid for it. Because I was all over the media for 40 years, but I wasn't paid for it. I did it like part of my job because the other thing is you don't want mm. conflicts of interest. Mm. You don't want Nigel Farage saying things in the House of Commons in order to get more headlines, in order to drive viewers to his show okay. on GB News. So I think what they'll do is they will make some changes because people want their MPs to be paid and they are paid properly and to be a public servant. I mean, there are some jobs, like, for example, Rosanna Allen Khan, who's a doctor in St George's Hospital, and she does work at A&E. And actually, mm. she brings that back to the House of Commons so mm. that when people say, this is what's going on in A&E, Rosanna Allen Khan jumps That's up and says, actually, that is not what's going on so because I was there last night on a night shift and this is what yeah. happens. So there's a difference with that sort of thing. I hadn't thought of the... I. I could see the sort of conflict of attention that you're not spending enough time being an MP because you're doing other jobs, but the conflict of interests around particularly broadcasting. So you do think that this will happen, Harriet? I think I think something will happen. I think that if people write books, especially if they're related to um, what they're doing in Parliament and the arguments they're making in Parliament and that they build on that, I think that probably the House of Commons will allow the Modernisation Committee will allow that to carry mm. on. But there is, and I, there's no way that the House of Commons Modernisation Committee will be saying MPs shouldn't be doing broadcasting. It's a question of what their incentive is yes. to do it. If their incentive to do broadcasting is to put across an argument on behalf of their constituents or politically or what they believe in, that's fine. But if they're doing it just for money, mm. then... That is not fine. Is there not a world in which, Ruth, though, that this could look like a Labour government kind of trying to shut down, for example, Nigel Farage because they don't much no, like he what can he's speak. Saying. He can speak on any programme. He just can't get paid for it because he's paid as an MP. It's about the money. It's not mm. about... It's definitely not shutting anybody down because, okay. I mean, I was not you shut can down. See where, you can see yeah. how the row's going to build, can't you? Yeah, I mean, I think if... If that was the intention, it's not it's not a stupid way of going about it because I don't think that the balance of opinion is going to be on Nigel Farage's side. Because I think most people, if you asked them in the street and said, your MP gets paid £90,000 a year, mm. do you think they should be working for you full-time or should they have a job on the side? Every single person, 100 out of 100, will say it's a full-time job. Mm. And as soon as you ask them things like, well, what happens if you've got an MP that happens to be a doctor, like Rosanna Ali Khan, or before that, um, the SNP had Philippa Whitford, who was a mm. oncologist, breast cancer. breast cancer surgeon. You know, do you think that they should be able to spend their weekend doing shifts? To and they'd say yes. And they'd say absolutely yes. Yeah. If you said, do you mm. think that if you were a farmer, you would have to give up your farm before you were allowed to run for parliament? They'd say, no, you shouldn't have to give up your farm. So you end up breaking it down to all of these mm. different things. I mean, not you, because you're you're a peer, but I mean, Jess Phillips was on. Yeah. We had a servant MP on our podcast. And I guess in this new world, a Jess would, or an Emily Thornberry, or they wouldn't no. necessarily be able to be no, on the podcast. Could, they could they be on the podcast. They it. couldn't be paid for it. OK, well, I think this is going to be one that's going to run and run. And of course, the media industry in itself will be fascinated by this story, I am sure. But look, before we go... We have not done who's on top and who's having an electoral dysfunction lately. I realise that we haven't done it for weeks, but can I just say, can we all agree that Donald Trump had a bit of an electoral dysfunction this week in that debate, which is going to stay with me for the rest of my life? Yeah, I think he did. I think what was really interesting was how it flipped, because the first debate was entirely a referendum. It was entirely scrutinising whether Joe Biden was up to the job. And this this one was about 
is it conceivable that Donald could come back? Kamala was going to have to be strong yeah. and presidential and, you know, articulate and all these other things. Whereas actually just, you know, as long as Donald Trump didn't soil his diapers and wipe it on the camera lens, he's probably going to get away with it. Um, I am worried, though, that everyone's talking about the dogs thing. I think if it comes on to are there illegal immigrants stealing and eating pets in the US anywhere? If that becomes the takeaway for the voters by November, and there won't be another debate because he got so roundly trounced, that actually plays to him. Whereas it, that shouldn't be the takeaway. The she room, literally pushed all his buttons and he played a, he played like a fiddle. Dangle, dangled Dang a fishing line. She pushed all his buttons and he played like an accordion. Does that work? That does work. Yeah, yeah but she, she did because she just she dangled lines yeah. about how small his crowd was, how he got fired by the American people, all this sort of stuff. And he fell for all of them. He baited. Yes, he took the bait. He, he took he the bait. He was baited by her. It must have driven him nuts. But I really worried about this thing about the immigrants and the dogs thing because he then got all the headlines. So the headlines weren't Kamala, who's trying to make herself known. But weren't, but, he then got all, for the but, maddest of reasons, he the, got all the headlines. Yes, and, but the point is, is that he got headlines in a way that people are laughing at him. Yeah. And, and if you look on the, you know, he well, nearly broke the internet so. with all the memes of Donald Trump and cats. Well, so it was I very hope funny. So. I hope so. But there are people who who want to be riled but up Harry, about immigration. Yes, yes. And there are people who love dogs. Yes. And he grabbed the headline. So, I mean, I just hyper nervous yes. about this American I guess, election. I guess the thing was, though, when you think about those debates, what are they trying to actually do? You're right. He his job was to land economy immigration and her job was to land the fact that this guy is not fit to be president, right? We can't talk about it any more because we're doing it in our live show. So if you want us to talk more about it, you have to come to Salford on Monday. I think there's like three tickets left. <laughs> so I hope there's only three tickets left. And if there is and you don't buy them, I'll buy them and just like put my mannequins in. And can I just say that's not dynamic pricing. So we're not like Oasis. It's that's not like the last. Think. It's not like the last <laughs> three tickets are going to be six million pounds. OK, so let's agree on this that Trump had an electoral dysfunction on the night but and Kamala came out on top, but that does not mean that that will necessarily set the destiny of this election. It's still in all the to balance. Go for. Absolutely obsessed with it. Now, before we go, remember last week my doppelganger got a mention. Loads of people on socials were suggesting me and the pianist from the early 90s band Scarlet might well be the same person. That was after an old Top of the Pops clip surfaced. Well, we said that lady in question is called Jo and she is now the boss of the Missing People charity. We have subsequently found out that Jo is also a dysfunctioner. No way! Yep. Oh, guess oh, what? Loved independent love song, Jo. I literally, I, literally I, I live in my best life. <laughs> but that Missing she, Person charity is really, really good as well. I mean, Joe and me, I told you, we're sisters from another mister. She's been in touch. Hi, this is Joe Yule. I had to get in touch after listening to your podcast last week when you talked about people on Twitter thinking Beth had been in a pop band in the 1990s. Well, it was me on Top of the Pops on the piano playing independent love song in my band Scarlet. It really made me smile to hear Ruth renaming it as another stupid love song. Luckily for you, Beth, I don't think anyone would mistake you for me now. I've got way longer hair and it was a lot of years ago. But I was really chuffed to get a shout out as a big fan of electoral dysfunction and for the charity Missing People, which I'm really proud to lead. As Harriet said, it's a great charity supporting some of the 170,000 people who go missing in the UK every year. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. And do let me know, Beth, if you'd ever like to get the band back together. Joe, Beth loves karaoke at the <sighs> Labour Party conference. She's a monster for the Labour Party karaoke. So she's going to be in Liverpool singing. If there's any way that you can get to Liverpool uh, for... Well, one, we've got a live show there over the Labour Party conference, so, so come, that'd be amazing. But two, to come and do a karaoke classic with Beth, that would just be... I mean, I'm there. Would she have the purple suit, Joe? Have you still got it? I've got a purple jacket. But um, I have to say, though, that not only can I not play the piano very well, Joe, I can play the piano, but not as well as you. Uh, I can't sing very well either, so it would definitely be a sort of band in which... Joe was carrying the heavy load here, but I'll do it if you do it, Joe. I literally love that voice. I could cry. Well, look, we've got to go now. 
to our live show, our first live show. Oh my God, we're doing it. Um, can you hear the smile? I actually think this will be fun. I'm everyone, quite nervous, but it'll be fun. smiling and I'm just talking really quietly and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you some Haribo. <laughs> or Haribo. I, uh, it's actually Haribo. I don't know why you're saying it like that, Ruth. Oh, yes, silly me. Right, now, don't forget to book your tickets to come and see us. Uh, there's a few left for Liverpool where Joe and I will be performing the love song I mean, uh, so with cool. Jess Phillips, Harriet, Ruth. Actually, that would be a laugh. We could all sing it. Oh, can we just do that? OK, I really want to do that. Uh, there's a handful left uh, for Salford on Monday with special guest Matt Ford. All the details are in the show notes for this episode. And remember, if you've got something you want to ask us, send us a voice note to the burner phone 07934 or email us at electraldysfunction at sky.uk. But now we're off to get our makeup done. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.